Quick note to our listeners, we need your help. We're close to 1 million views on YouTube, and we have over 5,000 subscribers. But if we can get to 10,000 subscribers by the end of this year, that will allow us to raise money for the Finding Genius Foundation and our study to help those suffering from anxiety, depression, and PTSD. Please just take a second and subscribe to the podcast. And if you can, like the video. That'll help us get more listeners. It'll help with the YouTube algorithm. And again, help us reach our goal of 10,000 subscribers and 1 million views. We're going to hit the 1 million views, it looks like, hopefully by May of 2022. But the 10,000 subscribers will be harder. That's going to take until the end of this year. Thank you. Do you struggle with concentration? Have you ever thought of your brain health long term? Bomar Nutrition is revolutionizing the nootropic and cognitive health industry with sharp nootropic powder and patent pending bright daily capsules powered by NeuroBloom. If you struggle with focusing, think of Sharp as brain food that supports concentration. Sharp works with your natural brain chemistry to provide a heightened sense of well-being that can delay cognitive decline and also increase mood. Bomar Sharp tastes amazing and comes in many different flavors, available in caffeinated and non-caffeinated versions. While Sharp is a short-term aid in cognitive health, think of Bright Daily Capsules as a way to improve overall brain health and prevent cognitive decline long-term. As we age, so does our brain. Supplementing with Bright has the potential to delay this aging process and helps your brain function optimally. Stay ahead of the curve and order yours today at bomarnutrition.com and save $5 off with code GENIUS5. Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense, common knowledge, or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do, but only 0.1% a real geniuses. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Yeah, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast. I'm here with Christy Trail. Uh, she's the Executive Director of the Pump Short Train Conservancy. The Conservancy of uh, is in New Orleans. It's a foundation that's working to create an environmentally sustainable, prosperous, and resilient region uh, through scientific research, education, and advocacy. They have a group called LAMPS, the Lakefront Algae and Microplastics Scientists. So, Christy, thank you for coming. Appreciate you being here. Thank you for having me. If you would, tell me about um, the Punch Our Train Conservancy and LAMPS. Where, where did it come from and what's its uh, mission and current activities? Okay, yeah, we are a nonprofit based in southeast Louisiana. Our name is comes from a local body of water that's nearby the city of New Orleans called Lake Pontchartrain. Um, it was named after uh, one of the French explorers named the lake at the time, but interestingly, it's actually not a lake. It's an estuary. So mm. a, lot, a lot of the work that we do looks after the entire estuary, which comprises about 25% of the state of Louisiana. So that's all the water flowing into the estuary, out of the estuary, and into the Gulf of Mexico. And our team is mostly scientists looking at things such as water quality and changes in habitat that surrounds not only the lake itself, but all throughout the estuary. Yeah, for people that don't know, what is the difference between a lake and an estuary? A lake is typically a body of water that's completely enclosed. So you'll see fresh water typically in a lake. Um, and maybe a river drains into it, and maybe a little river drains out, but they typically are fresh water. In the estuary, because we are tidally connected to the Gulf of Mexico, the water is brackish, so it's a mix of salt water and fresh water. What kind of consequences does that have for you know how the, the estuary functions and the wildlife around it? What's, what makes it different than a lake in terms of the wildlife, again, and the, uh, the action of the, of the, the water? Well, I guess the interesting thing about wildlife within the estuary is we see all sorts. We see freshwater creatures such as alligators, and we see saltwater creatures such as manatees uh, within the estuary. And because it comes in from the Gulf of Mexico, it's shallow, warm water. A lot of saltwater creatures use estuaries as nurseries. So they'll come into the estuary and have their babies and then go back out into the salty waters of the Gulf of Mexico. So that's typically, you know, estuaries are just tend to be rich with life, you know, in a teeming ecosystem. And that's great, 
But one thing we don't have a handle on is, you know, what are the microplastics concentration within our estuary here in southeast Louisiana? We have a lot of urban runoff. Obviously, we have a densely populated area on the south shore of Lake Pontchartrain, but we have a rural area as well on the north shore of Lake Pontchartrain. So we get a lot of urban runoff um, and rural runoff and really trying to quantify what impacts that has on the marine life in the estuary. When and how did people notice that there was uh, microplastics? How do they manifest? Well, we started this program because we do not yet have a baseline of what's in Lake Pontchartrain, and I'm not going to say that it was prompted by a significant event, but we were just curious to try to understand what's there. One thing I think that triggered kind of the awareness is in 2015 there was a federal law that was passed called the Microbead Free Waters Act of 2015, and that banned microbeads in cosmetics and personal care products. So prior to that point in time, there were a lot of, you know, readily available at-home use products that had microplastics in them that were washed down the drain, for lack of a better term, right? So uh, face wash that had exfoliating properties in it, those materials often contained plastics. But in 2015, those were banned. And those microbeads were so tiny, they were not able to be filtered out by just, you know, what's commonly used in a lot of the stormwater drains and wastewater treatment systems that are in use today. So then all of those microbeads were just ending up, you know, in our, in our neighborhood, either in Lake Pontchartrain or the Mississippi River and ultimately into the Gulf of Mexico. So we really wanted to understand what's happening here. Well, when you look at the microplastics, what do they look like? Is it... Uh... You know, soda bottles and various degrees of uh, degradation. Do you see microbeads? Like, what, what do you see and what sizes and shapes? Well, the definition of a microplastic is less than five millimeters in length. So that is visible to the human eye. We haven't seen highly visible microplastics, if you will, in the lake, but we do see much larger versions of plastic all around the perimeter of the lake that usually just comes from, again, either urban runoff or, unfortunately, litter that occurs, you know, just around the area. But over time, those large plastic bottles or bottle caps or straws will break down into smaller particles, which would then become less than five millimeters in length and thus a microplastic. So we'd like to determine, you know, is there a way to eventually break down where it's coming from? We're not there yet. Right now we're really just trying to quantify if these microplastics exist in a significant quantity at all in our backyard. Well, if you go, is the, the estuary, I would guess, is huge, but are there areas that you, know, you, can, you can access by boat or by walking uh, where you can see different types of microplastics or somewhere there's nothing and somewhere there's a lot? Yes, for sure. There's a lot of, you know, heavily u- utilized areas for recreation around the lake. So we'll see a much, you know, pretty big uh, regular occurrence of uh, litter and trash along the shoreline and those, you know, areas heavily utilized for recreation and some of the more remote areas, you may or may not see some litter. Unfortunately, sometimes we'll see like somebody may have illegally dumped some tires or maybe something like a hot water heater or an abandoned boat, but we don't usually see the smaller versions of plastic. But what we don't have a handle on is all of those items eventually probably break down into microplastics, right? So we'd like to sample in both the heavily utilized areas where we see a significant amount of plastic bottles and straws and bottle caps, and then also in the, you know, more remote areas that don't have a lot of access and use but may still have microplastics in it, and we'd like to compare. And so we rely on the community members around Lake Pontchartrain to help us gather that data. And we've done some training with them on what to look for, where to collect the samples, how to follow certain sampling protocols to ensure that the sample is, you know, valid, if you will, and able to be analyzed. And then we operate a laboratory where community members can come in and test those samples for microplastics. And we're not directing them where to go. We would like to really understand where are people interested in collecting a sample? What are they concerned about? What are they seeing? So we give them this training, which is really, you know, documenting the date, time, and location of the sample collection, making sure that it gets to us within a certain amount of time to be analyzed. Uh, But we don't tell them where to go. We just send them on their way with sample bottles and say, 
go collect data. We want to see where you're interested in. And then when they bring it to our laboratory, they will log in the sample, document the date and time it was collected and where it was collected, and then share the results with us because they're running it right there live in our laboratory on site. And have people, again, going around the, the estuary and seeing, okay, plastics seem to build up here but not here, or, you know, low tide, high tide, here's where we see sub-10 to collect. Is it based on the areas of heavy use, or does it change uh, when there's not tourists? Or has anyone observed that, again, the motion of the plastics, even the large ones around the, the estuary? Yeah, we don't. We've only been doing this program now for about six months, so we don't yet have a lot of trend data to document, you know, where are the higher concentrated areas, where are the lower concentrated areas, and, and what is driving that. So that's what we do aim to get out of this program. We received a grant to start this in uh, April of 2020, and we all know what happened then. So because the laboratory is so hands-on and involves, you know, community members coming in in person and touching laboratory equipment, it took us a little over a year to really kind of get back into the groove of being open and ready for people to come in and test those samples. So we really didn't get this thing going until the end of 2021. So now that we're here and we've got, you know, about 100 people now trained up with bottles in their hands, we are starting to get some data, and yes, the microplastics are present. Every now and then we'll get somebody that comes in and just wants to test their drinking water, which I find fascinating. And crazy enough, we have found microplastics even in drinking water, but it's hard to pick apart, right? Did a piece of their clothing shed into the sample when they were collecting it, or is it really microplastics in the water? You know, we don't, we don't have all the detailed data yet to start trending where it's coming from and, and what might be driving it yet. Do you struggle with concentration? Have you ever thought of your brain health long term? Bomar Nutrition is revolutionizing the nootropic and cognitive health industry with sharp nootropic powder and patent pending bright daily capsules powered by NeuroBloom. If you struggle with focusing, think of Sharp as brain food that supports concentration. Sharp works with your natural brain chemistry to provide a heightened sense of well-being that can delay cognitive decline and also increase mood. Bomar Sharp tastes amazing and comes in many different flavors available in caffeinated and non-caffeinated versions. While Sharp is a short-term aid in cognitive health, think of Bright Daily Capsules as a way to improve overall brain health and prevent cognitive decline long-term. As we age, so does our brain. Supplementing with Bright has the potential to delay this aging process and helps your brain function optimally. Stay ahead of the curve and order yours today at bomarnutrition.com and save $5 off with code GENIUS5. Well, what do you see in the microplastics that you observe? Are there any uh, trends or unusual things that you're observing already? So far, um, what we're seeing is straws are probably the biggest impact. And I think it's both they're very thin, right, and they blow out of trash cans that, you know, while there may be receptacles to collect litter and trash in areas that are used for recreation, unfortunately, being on such a large lake, as you mentioned, the wind does get kicked up pretty high. So even trash cans that have covers on them, you know, stuff can blow out of those. So we do see a lot of straws just blown around the ground and they tend to break down pretty easy into tiny little particles. Similarly, you know, we're fortunate the area is very well maintained by the local parks department, which means they cut the grass pretty, pretty regularly, but sometimes they cut the grass and there's straws that are there that they don't see. And so they get shredded up into tiny little pieces a few days later, it might rain, and it all washes into the lake. So we see a lot of that collected into our samples. Oh, interesting. When, when you see the straws, are they still straws, or now they're just tiny bits of straw, and you can tell that they, they came from bigger straws? Yeah, we can tell just because you'll see the coloration on them. You know, maybe it's a white and yellow piece or a red piece, you know, we can in that thin plastic that started to break down just a little bit in the sunlight. We can usually see those, you know, pieces coming down. And similarly, fibers. So, again, it's hard for us to detect quite yet if those are fibers that are coming off of clothing or if it's fibers that may be you know, a, a degraded vessel that has contributed somewhere in the waterway. We haven't quite picked that apart yet, but we do see a good bit of plastic fibers in the water samples that are brought in. How long do you think it takes for a straw to get degraded, and how does it get degraded? Maybe it's a silly question, but what do you think? Well, it, again, because it's so thin, um, it's a good question. In bright sunlight, it'll break down just really in a matter of days. It'll start to get that, you know, 
uh, really dry, brittle sense. And so, again, when they come out to cut the grass, it gets shredded into a million tiny pieces. Unfortunately, you know, it's just they're hard to see sometimes in the thick grass and not able to be picked up before they cut the grass. So, but left unalone, unattended, even when the grass cutters don't come by and shred them up, they do break down into tiny pieces pretty quickly. Oh, what, what makes them break down into tiny pieces? Just because they're thin and they get torn? Or, like, again, how long do you think it takes? And has anyone has anyone tried to model this? Maybe they have a, a rock tumbler that they put some straws in and, you know, some water and a few rocks and things like that and see how fast they degrade. Has anyone tried to map this out? That's a great question, and I'm sure someone has. We have not done that. What we see, though, is just really from the pure sunlight when they're sitting outside because we're talking about these recreational areas where we're seeing this. They are exposed to quite a bit of sunlight, and that accelerates the breakdown. So it just, you know, the straws then become really brittle and not as flexible when they're exposed to sunlight for long periods of time. And here in South Louisiana, it really does get hot. So with the straws, you know, sitting outside along the shoreline, um, even in the water with the sunlight, they get broken down pretty easily into brittle brittle parts. Okay. So they become brittle, and then the, the natural forces can easily tear them apart. Exactly. When they break apart, anything special in how they break apart? Are they jagged? Do they, do they make little ringlets, or do they vertically break along the length of the straw, and they just make, uh, like, long fibers or pieces? Like, what do they look like? Yeah, it's usually angular pieces with uh, more sharp edges. So we're, you know, we're not seeing the heavily degraded pieces that may have gotten rounded over time. It's more of the fresher pieces that tend to have jagged edges. Oh, and then the other ones just get ground down so they're smoother, but they don't really, do they have any specific morphology or they're just like little one-sided pieces of uh, of plastic? They're just little one-sided, right, because the, the cylindrical shape of the straw degrades pretty quickly once it's exposed to that much sunlight. And it'll become just a brittle, you know, pile of shards of plastic, <laughs> which washes all around the lake. So, you know, and unfortunately for marine life, they don't really know the difference if they see something floating on the water, or even if it sinks down to the bottom. What we would, you know, ultimately like to see one day is, you know, what is that effect on marine life? Right now, we're just testing the water. We're not testing, you know, any of the innards of the marine life. But, you know, that should be some sort of leading indicator if we see in the water more than likely it's affecting the marine life. Your goal first is to figure out where these are coming from primarily, and then what? I mean, could could screening systems be put up at certain points in the estuary, or would laws have to be changed to stop dumping, or, I mean, how do you tackle this problem, and how would you reduce the load going into the estuary? Yeah, I think it's going to be um, a multi-pronged approach. So when we look at runoff into the estuary, we're typically looking at stormwater. So... You know, that just free flows directly from the street into the lake, right? It's not treated or filtered or caught in most instances. So to prevent that litter and runoff from entering into the lake really becomes more of an education program to the community at large to have them understand the full cycle of, you know, when you dispose of this plastic container improperly and it washes out into the lake, this is what happens. So I think There's a good bit of education we'd like to see ultimately on the back end of this once we start to get some data. And on the wastewater treatment side, so, you know, if if one were washing, you know, microplastics down the drain, like like what used to happen before the law was passed in 2015, um, working with wastewater treatment plants to understand what filtration systems could be possibly used to collect those tiny particles so they're not discharged out on the back end. Some of these, like I said, the microbeads that are in a lot of these cosmetics were so tiny, smaller than a grain of sand, it was really hard for the wastewater treatment plants to capture that. So it was a great great new rule put in place just to prevent those from happening in the first place. What do you see is happening to the estuary based on the microplastics pollution? Is it that animals are dying and have stuff in their stomachs, or has it changed the migration patterns? Or you know, what, what are you seeing of the effects? We haven't seen any of those effects, I think. You know, I think we really just want to get some baseline data on what's happening on the water. You know, we'll we'll have some days after heavy rain, we see a good bit of litter floating on the water. And then we might see some ducks that are swimming through that litter. And we're, like, trying to understand, you know, is that impacting their habitat, their quality of life? Surely it is. But, you know, really, try, again, trying to understand what exactly is in the water. We're not really testing any animals right now. 
Um, for us as a nonprofit, what we're trying to do at this stage is get community input, try to understand, you know, where do they think microplastics are, help us try to track it down and figure out where it's at, and hopefully we can use this data to make a difference. Well, um, what do you expect that, uh, I mean, what do you hypothesize that you might see that could be actionable? Like, what would you guess the scenario would look like and what can you do? I think there are some things other communities have done around the country that we might be able to replicate down here. You know, some cities around the United States have banned the use of disposable straws, you know, except in certain instances. I mean, maybe maybe there's some instances at a healthcare facility where um, some of the patients require the use of straws. Okay, that's fine. But in your regular restaurants, um, when you sit down for a meal, there are places around the country that have banned the use of straws. Similarly, they've banned um, one-time use plastic bags. You know, those are steps that other communities are taking around the country and kind of testing out. And I think what we're curious to see is, are those programs effective? Are they making a difference? Is it reducing litter? Is it reducing microplastics and waterways? And is that something we can maybe look at, you know, doing down here in Louisiana? Okay. Well, very good. Um, what's the best way for people to find out more about your work and to contribute when the time comes? Where can they go? Um, all this information is up on our website at scienceforourcoast.org. We have a whole web page dedicated to our LAMPS program um, because in addition to microplastics, we're also testing for algae. So that's where the A comes in in the LAMPS program. All that information is on our website. We would love for anybody in Louisiana listening to this to join us and help us come collect samples. But for the rest of you out there curious what's happening down here, keep an eye on our website. We'll be posting the results soon. Uh, last question. Have you seen any interaction with um, with algae or with uh, other organisms in the plastics, you know, bacterial growth, biofilms, things like that, or is it unknown still? We haven't seen a connection from the two. It's just two separate, you know, things that we're looking at within our estuary. We started to see in the past couple of years some pop-ups of algae here and there, but we haven't quite pinpointed what's causing it, where it's coming from, what's prompting it. You know, we are subject down here in Louisiana. We receive so much runoff from the rest of the country because we're down here at the bottom. So when the Mississippi River drains, it drains 41% of the United States. And all along the Mississippi River, you know, there are a lot of large swaths of agricultural farmland that may or may not be contributing to some nutrients in that runoff. And when that runoff hits the estuary, you know, what's, is it prompting algae to pop up? We haven't quite pinpointed that, but that's what we want to see if there's any leading indicators to when we might see algae. So when community members are out there in the lake, you know, we're not out there every single moment. Uh, when they're out there, if they see something that might look like algae, we ask them to collect a sample and bring it into our lab so we can try to see what's happening. Very good. Uh, Christy, all right, so I got this link where uh, people will go to, yep. scienceforourcoast.org. And thank you very much for coming on the podcast. I appreciate it. Thank you. If you have any other questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. Do you struggle with concentration? Have you ever thought of your brain health long term? Bomar Nutrition is revolutionizing the nootropic and cognitive health industry with sharp nootropic powder and patent-pending bright daily capsules, powered by NeuroBloom. If you struggle with focusing, think of Sharp as brain food that supports concentration. Sharp works with your natural brain chemistry to provide a heightened sense of well-being that can delay cognitive decline and also increase mood. Bomar Sharp tastes amazing and comes in many different flavors, available in caffeinated and non-caffeinated versions. While Sharp is a short-term aid in cognitive health, think of Bright Daily Capsules as a way to improve overall brain health and prevent cognitive decline long-term. As we age, so does our brain. Supplementing with Bright has the potential to delay this aging process and helps your brain function optimally. Stay ahead of the curve and order yours today at BomarNutrition.com and save $5 off with code GENIUS5. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.